Hi everyone, this is Mr. Neil Reitertay, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. So the patient who attended with bilateral, so when we say bilateral, we mean both ears. If it's one ear, we would say unilateral. Uh, bilateral, fully occluding, very dry, rough um, surfaced um, earwax. And we're just in the right ear, which is the worst ear of the two. Now, when you have dry earwax, it could be due to the patient having a specific gene mutation. Um, so there's generally two types of earwax, dry and wet. And what decides and deciphers whether you have dry or wet earwax is actually uh, a mutation, specific mutation on the ABCC11 gene. If you have uh, one dominant guanine allele, that means you have the gene for wet earwax. So you have a higher concentration of what we call modified alpocrine glands, which are um, also known as ceremonious glands. And these are like the same sweat glands you find under your armpits. And these glands secrete uh, an oily sweat. And that oily sweat provides you with wet earwax, very slimy wax. If Instead of that dominant guanine allele, you have two homo homozygous, which means the same, recessive adenine alleles. Then you have the gene for dry earwax. And this is what this patient's got. They've got very dry earwax. Also, if someone's got a condition called otitis externa, which is um, an umbrella term for an infection or an inflammation of the outer ear canal. Um, it can range from the severe uh, swelling and infection or psoriasis, eczema of the ear. Uh, which this is what this patient's got. It's got a bit of dry skin, a bit of itchiness, flaky skin. You probably see that around the perimeter of the entrance of the ear canal. This dry skin amalgamates into earwax. So 60% of earwax is actually dead skin. In this patient, I would say it's a bit more of a higher concentration, around 70%. And that makes the wax a bit dry. And you can see this, this wax was really dry. It was lodged all the way deep. You can see around the edge on the lateral canal wall, there's some dry skin here. And what I'm going to do... I'm going to gently peel that. So I've just swapped the suction probe, a standard Zollner suction probe, for a fine end gauge, well, I will in a minute. And that will help me peel this dead skin off the canal. Um, when we train our clear wax delegates, I, would, I always explain to delegates, when you're uh, a beginner and you're still learning, uh, you're a bit inexperienced, don't worry too much about peeling the skin off. Um, it's only when you become more experienced and you, you can understand the anatomy a bit more and what you, can't, what you can and can't do to a patient's ear. Because certain parts of the ear are, are not sensitive or less sensitive than others and you need to have that experience to know when to try and remove it and when, when not to. And in the case of this patient, I decided to remove it because it's, the skin is not going to come out by itself. She has got a bit of otitis externa. You can see that's just scratching at the entrance just here on the right hand side. So, and that's because of the dry skin. So by peeling this dead skin, it's going to help the patient. So we're just gently lifting it off the base of the ear canal here. We're quite lateral near the entrance. It's, the skin adhesions here are quite strong. Um, I always compare dead skin keratin, like double-sided sticky tape. Um, so typically you have one side when it comes to the ear that sticks itself onto the surface of the ear canal and the underneath side quite, quite often envelope itself around the plug of wax. And when we're pe peeling the skin, imagine you've got a stamp, a, a poster stamp on, on, a, on a letter and you'll have to gently peel that off without tearing the envelope itself. And that's what we're doing in the, in the case when we peel the skin of the ear. So it's a very delicate um, procedure, requires a lot of finesse and obviously a steady hand. You can just see the view of the, <coughs> of the eardrum here, even from this distance. So the endoscope's barely in the ear, so we're about two and a half, three centimetres away from the eardrum. You can still visualise the, the eardrum quite well there. And we can even see the light reflex. And whenever I'm peeling skin, I'm using this like almost brush stroke movements away from the ear canal. So I'm making contact with the dead skin and then lifting the skin away in little flakes. And it's not about getting it in one flake. Sometimes you just do it slowly but surely. The patient has already got some um, prescribed medication for their otitis externa, some acetic acid spray which should help. You just see how thick the skin is and how it strongly adhered it is to the to canal wall. So this is the anterior canal walls so the front part of the ear canal. So 
Sometimes you just have to be really patient. Um, the last thing we want to do now in the bony part, we want to really avoid making contact with the canal wall. On the outer cartilaginous portion, you can see I was putting a bit of pressure trying to lift the skin off. That's because the cartilaginous portion, it's not as sensitive as the bony part of the ear canal. It's a bit more flexible. And we have some fatty tissue there sometimes as well. And the skin that lines the outer third of the ear canal is a lot thicker. It's about one millimetre in thickness, whereas the skin that lines the inner two thirds of the ear canal, it's about 10 times thinner. So it's 0.1 millimetre in thickness. Therefore, it provides less of a buffer um, to the bony part of the ear canal. So there's the patient's eardrum. Onto the left ear now, you can see quite a few cilia at the entrance. So it, there is quite a lot of dry ear wax here as well, but it's not as occluding, I would say, as the original right ear. The right ear as well, some of this dry wax is really lodged immediately against the eardrum, whereas this is more lateral, so near the entrance and mid canal. Slowly but surely, we're just wriggling out this dry wax. So this type of wax, it can be, because it's got a rough surface, when the patient talks or chews, it can it can rub against the canal wall. So when you move your jaw, your ear canal, can, when you open your jaw, for example, your ear canal widens um, up to the second bend, so about up to a centimetre into the ear canal, the cartilaginous portion. And when you really clasp your jaw, you kind of almost somewhat contract your ear canal, you narrow it. So when the patient talks or chews, when the ear canal goes up and down, it can be rubbing against the, the surface of this dry wax. It can be a bit uncomfortable for the patient. You can see the occlusion's gone, we can see the eardrum. I'm just mopping up from now all these dry pieces of wax around the perimeter of the entrance of the ear canal. A lot, we get a lot of questions as to um, you know, queries why we don't trim the hairs at the entrance. So, now, these hairs are actually there for a purpose. They have several purposes. Now, contrary to belief, earwax is actually healthy for you. And earwax is a combination of dead skin and generally uh, either just um, a substance called sebum, which is like an oily lipid um, secretion. The same oily lipid secretion we find on our scalp. So the hair strands on our scalp secrete this oil to protect the hair. Um, and also the ceremonious glands, the sweat glands. And they amalgamate with dead skin in the ear that naturally collects and that forms earwax. Earwax is a protective, um, it forms a protective barrier against the ear canal because it's acidic, it inhibits certain bacterial growth, uh, it helps to repel insects. And because it's oily and greasy, it acts as a natural moisturiser um, for the skin so it doesn't dry and crack. And also wax is hydrophobic, it's kind of oily, so any water that gets into the ear, which is oily, the water's bad for you, it can hopefully try and allow the water to roll out the ear naturally. So these sort of ceremonious glands and sebaceous glands, uh, they connect to the hair follicle deep, in, deep at the root, so that's where the sweats and oils come out, so that's why they're important.